to the Sabbath School for July 20th, 2013. We're going to change the title a little bit, The Little People. That's right. Whom Jesus people. blessed. Yeah. So we have been studying about the blessedness of hospitality and the Good Samaritan from last time. What a wonderful lesson. I think we could study that for a long time. There's so much there. And this one too. The little people that Jesus blessed. Jesus was ever a lover of children. He accepted their childish sympathy and their open, unaffected love. And God said, according to this lesson, according to what Jesus said, that we need to become like little children, unaffected in our love, always curious to know something new, always ready to hear the voice of their Father and to come running to Him when He is near. So let's run to Him right now in a word of silent prayer. If you'll join us, please. Well, thank you for being with us, Brother uh, Juarez. I know you were just in Honduras. Welcome back. I heard you had some good meetings there. Yes, we were in Nicaragua, next to Honduras. Oh. And some of the leaders did come from Honduras and Guatemala, also from Costa Rica and Panama. And we had about 320 people on Sabbath. 26 young people came forward to accept Jesus as their personal Savior and prepare for baptism and we ordained one minister. It was a nice conference. Well, praise the Lord. So, we had some young people there, and we encouraged our young people. I, you know, we're starting a, a new program here on Wednesday nights with studying with young people. We hope to put that on the internet as well. So, pray for our young people, and uh, let's also remember those who are traveling for the, for the Lord's sake and those working in difficult places. So the lesson goes on to say the grateful praise of, from their lips was music to his ears and refreshed his spirit when oppressed by contact with crafty and hypocritical men. Whenever the Savior, wherever the Savior went, the, uh, the benign, benignity of his countenance and his gentle, kindly manner won the love and confidence of children. So. You know, one of the things that really impressed me about this lesson when I thought about it was that here we're talking about the people whom Jesus blessed. Now, who was it that blessed Jesus when he rode on a donkey into Jerusalem? It was the children. It was the children, primarily. So he blessed them, and they later blessed him. I thought that was a very interesting thought. And, of course, he raised Lazarus from the death, dead from the tomb, and he had to go to himself practically because of that. But now, there's a very important statement in the Spirit of Prophecy which we've said before, as we treat our children, so we treat Christ for a year. Well, let's think about that principle, that God has given us these children, and we talk about the blessing of the children. You know, some people think that blessing the children is a you know, pagan thing or whatever, but it's not. Jesus did it. He lifted the children up before God, and ask a blessing upon them, but mostly, as we read in the lesson in other places, it was a uh, commitment of the parents, a call to the parents to raise their children and nurture admission of the Lord. I was just in Ghana, we did a child dedication there, and the central theme, theme of that dedication was, here, take this child, he's on loan from God, raise him to the nurture and admission, admission of the Lord, because the children are with us only for some uh, 20 years or so, and then they're living their life on their own. So consideration of the children. What was the first question we have here in this lesson? How were the children's shouting and singing hosannas in the temple regarded by the priests and the scribes? So, I'm sorry we didn't outline the lesson first because we have consideration of the children, appreciation of the children, then we have mothers wishing for their children, and the need of Christian sensitivity, and also social attention for children and youth. So children are especially sensitive, the mothers also, and it seems we're, um, we're in need to learn this lesson well and really consider what's happening. You know, it would be interesting if we're recording now, and if a child would walk in, what would we do? I would invite the child right into the, the meeting because child doesn't know what's going on, we can't scold it, 
what would be the use of that? And if we're studying this lesson, what, 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 that would be kind of a hypocritical thing to do. Is it, wow, we're, we're recording, go away. That's or, what the <laughs> disciples did. Yeah, that's what the disciples did. That's right, and that's what Jesus tells us not to do. That's what he tells us not to do. Mm -hmm. You know, executives today who have young children, and the children come in the room, you're an executive with young children. What do you do? I welcome them. You welcome them in. All the time. You pull, pull them on your lap. It might be a very important, serious meeting. Mm -hmm. I notice what you do. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Because the precious little lives that we have are so um, tender and so touchable. We need to be in consideration of the children. So how were the children shouting and singing Hosanna in the temple regarded by the priests and scribes? They were jealous. They were sore displeased, the scripture says. They didn't like them praising Jesus because they didn't like Jesus. And they were jealous. They wanted that praise for themselves, not for Christ. And the following question says, do the scriptures agree with this evaluation of praise to the Savior? Yes, it does agree because the scripture says that God would allow the babes and sucklings to praise the Messiah so that they would still the enemy in the avenger, the enemy. Those Pharisees, those priests were the enemies of Christ. When I think of this, I remember the time in the Reformation when the, the gospel was forbidden to be preached. And whom did God use? He used the children in the 1840s, and there's a reference to that in the note. As God wrought through the children at the time of Christ's first advent, so he wrought through them in the giving of the message of his second advent. And in the, country, in the countries of Scandinavia, these kids would stand on tables, on chairs, and they'd preach the word of God because it was illegal for adults to do so. Yeah, so God has used many means to preach the gospel, and even when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, he said, if these be quiet, the stones would cry out. Mm -hmm. And many times God does use uh, symbolically the stones to preach the gospel because we can do nothing against the gospel but only for the gospel. But it's wonderful when uh, we've prepared our children. We need to prepare our children for that moment. They can't just stand up and preach if they haven't heard the message. And understand it. That's and understand true. it, right. So, they need to have their spirit right with the Lord so that the Lord can speak through them. So that means we have to take time and be with them and share with them and invite them in, take them to Bible studies, to take them uh, joyfully to church. You know, if we're complaining about going to church or whatever, it's not a good example for the children. So we should be willing and eager to go to church. We should show our eagerness uh, to be there. And that is a great praise, and that's a testimony to our children also. Hosanna to the son of David. I, I wonder how it would have been to be there, be that, in that crowd, to hear those words. You know, today, people gather in streets and places, but what are they shouting? What, what kind of message do we see on the, on the news today? In Egypt, in uh, uh, Florida. A negative message. Now, the, the news is always bringing those who are protesting uh -huh. and not praising. So we have there the opposite of what we have uh, in, the, in the scenes of the scriptures. God's word must be fulfilled that the proclamation of the Savior's coming should be given to all peoples, tongues, and nations. Amen. So uh, Jesus' appreciation of children. Number two, what comparison did Jesus give when the disciples were arguing over which of them should be the greatest? Oh, did Jesus pull around? <laughs> Yeah, that's a wonderful scene. You know, they were uh, on the mountain there, and uh, that son of this man who said, Lord, help my unbelief, um, and they killed the, the disciples' child. And it wasn't long after that that they were in the house together, and Jesus was asking, what was it you were discussing on the way? And, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't answer him mm -hmm. because they were answering uh, who would be the greatest. the greatest. And then it was that Jesus invited a child in. I wonder how many children there were around at that time. Probably quite a few. So there was a child walking by or just playing around, and maybe Jesus would go up and pick the child up by the hand and come and sit with him, you know, stand in the middle of the He was disciples. small enough that he could be carried. I imagine a toddler, yeah, or maybe three, four years old. That's what I imagine also. 
you know, that those children are very pensive when you give them attention. And uh, Jesus was saying, see this little child? You must become like this little child. What do you think he meant? How would you define that? Because it doesn't mean like, we're not talking about, when he talked to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus said, well, what do you mean? I have to be put in my mother's womb? Uh -oh. uh, does that hit? We could take this literally like Nicodemus. Oh, you mean we need to get down and crawl around on our knees and be very humble? Is that what he means? What does he mean by this? Yes, what he meant is that we need to be like children. We need to be forgiving. If you look at children, they fight, but they forgive each other so fast, and they forget that they fought. They don't have a sense of prejudice about them. They look at all other children the same way. And children have the great benefit of believing, of trusting. You tell a child something, and she believes it. And she will treasure what you say. And also, children are always growing. And I think that is also part of the reason why Jesus says we need to be like children. We need to be growing. Children also have the sense of awe, of curiosity. They are surprised by little things. You mm -hmm. see their big eyes. And the older we get, the more things we see, the more it takes to surprise us. I think you <laughs> defined it pretty well. I, I couldn't add hardly anything to that. Uh, you know, there was a statement, uh, what you know uh, is the, uh, the thing that prevents you from learning more. But children are never at that point. They, they never take what they know and assume that they know it all. They're always willing to learn some more. So they're, they're teachable. Very teachable, very humble, and aspiring to learn. I read in Proverbs, I was thinking of this text, He that begetteth um, a wise child shall have joy in him. Mm. And the father and the mother shall be glad, and she that beareth thee shall be glad. Mm. So it's a wonderful thing to have this character uh, there with us. And so at Capernaum, which, we, which is a place where he made his uh, um, primary dwelling, uh, being in a house, he asked them what was it that they disputed on the way, and he sat down and called the, uh, the twelve to him, and he took a child. So think about this. Now, we know that Jesus took Capernaum as his center of worship, but there were children there. There were children playing out in the street. They were running around, uh, maybe playing something, some of their games or whatever it might be, maybe even hide-and-seek or uh, playing tag or something. And, uh -huh. and Jesus pulled one of those children into the crowd that was around him. And he explained that those who possess the spirit of Christ will have no ambition to occupy a position above their brethren. Do you know the story? I heard it just recently. It's very interesting. It's out of Africa. A man uh, had uh, something special that was for the children in Africa. And there's about a half a dozen little girls there. And he said, I'll give this to the first one who can run and touch the tree and get back to me. And all the girls looked at each other, and then none of them ran. And he said, well, aren't you going to go? And they said, they looked at each other and said, no. If we can't all have it, none of us should have it. <laughs> So they held hands and ran to the tree and ran back, and they all got it together. <laughs> so that was very nice of the children, that they would think of each other in that way. And that's what it says here. Those who possess the spirit of Christ will have no ambition to occupy a position above their brother. So children, that's another thing we probably didn't say, that children want to be accepted. They want to have that camaraderie, and that's well, they love that portion. And one of the hardest things for children is when they're excluded, when there is uh, clubs and, and uh, what do you call that, cliques in school, sometimes that happens. And this is not very nice. So it is still true that children are the most susceptible to the teachings of the gospel. Comment upon that. Yes, they're the most susceptible to the teachings of the gospel because they are teachable. They're willing to be taught. They're the best students. Their hearts are open. And it's not till we get 
hope that we are exposed to false doctrine that we have to unlearn the false doctrine to learn the truth. And so the children have a cleaner slate. Well, that's an interesting thing, too, because when you tell a child a lie when he's young, and then he grows up and, you know, you, he enjoys living that life, like Santa Claus, for example, then you get to seven or eight years old and you realize that you've been led astray, or you might say, uh, played along with by your parents. What does that do for your trust of humanity? Oh, it was very disappointing. I can tell you I was about seven or eight when I learned that Santa Claus didn't exist. Somebody told me at school, and I came home, and I was crying. And I asked my mom, is that true, that you're Santa Claus, that Santa Claus doesn't exist? That was devastating for me, to believe that my parents had lied to me and society had lied to me for all of my life till then. So it does change us. There's a moment in our lives when we learn something that isn't true, uh, that we've been told, just because it was a joy to us or whatever at that moment. So it's a very interesting concept, too, uh, if you think about it, that when you grow up in the truth, you grow up with real reality. Not that you want to force that upon children, because they'll learn it fast enough. Mm -hmm. But they need to be educated in the spiritual things that are real and not among those things which have a false character and fade away. And children also have an easier time learning. You've heard the saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, that's not exactly true, but it's harder. Yes. And children can learn. They have an easier time of learning. Think about our technology today with computers and tablets. I see five-year-olds, six-year-olds using their tablets and their computers, and they learn it so easily, and yet uh, grandpa and grandma have a hard time. That's because until the age of seven, the mind is very plastic. It starts to lose its plasticity after seven. They say if you've learned a, le a language before seven, and you keep it till the past 11, you will speak it without uh, any problem. So that age is very uh, important for new things, up to seven. And then it's those, those synapses in the brain start to stuff off that they're not being used. So the brain sort of finalizes about the time of pu puberty. And if you haven't spoken a language, it's going to be more difficult to speak it perfectly. Let's go to question three. It says, what did Jesus pray to his father concerning the sincerity and the willingness of children? Uh, the note here is just beautiful. According to the spirit of prophecy, what did he see in the children who were brought to him to receive his blessing? Yeah, I underlined here that uh, the beauty and precious, preciousness of truth, which are undiscerned by worldly wise, are constantly unfolding to those who have a trusting, childlike desire to know and to do the will of God. So it's very interesting how the Bible is written. Uh -huh. It's written in a way that those who have a trusting, Christ-like faith can understand it. But those who want to put themselves above the word and cavil and misrepresent what is being said don't understand it. Uh -huh. We go only when we push ourselves beyond what we already know, as someone said. Uh -huh. So what are children always doing? They're doing that very thing. They're growing. They're pushing themselves beyond what all they are already know. And they grow at a remarkable rate. I mean, a baby who is born by the age of one has tripled its weight. Mm -hmm. So if it's born at six pounds, it'll weigh 18 pounds at mm -hmm. one year. And when you think of its height or length as we measure mm -hmm. babies, It'll duplicate its life in one year. And at two years old, it's reached its half of its height. If you measure a child yes, at two years old, that's, that's, it's yeah. high, you could double that, that's how tall they're going to be. And when you look at their vocabulary, 10,000 words the first year. Well, I have other statistics that it takes, they learn five words, then it goes to 50 words, then it goes to 500 words. Every year, it just grows. Remarkably. Mm. You know, five words at one, 50 at two, 
500 at 3. And it's, it's, it's a logarithmic growth. Geometric. Yeah. Yes. Well, what I wanted to also mention in this text is that Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father of heaven, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, but revealed them in the babes. And, of course, uh, we're going to read um, in that, we read already in that first note, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength. So from the children, God has also brought a wonderful lesson. Tell us what the testimony says. You mean in the children? Yes. In the children who were brought in contact with him, Jesus saw the men and women who should be heirs of his grace and subjects of his kingdom, and some would uh, become martyrs for his sake. He knew that those children would listen to him and accept him as their redeemer far more readily than would grown-up people, many of whom were the worldly wise and hard-hearted. So in his teachings, he came down to their level. He, the majesty of heaven, did not hesitate to answer their questions and simplify his important lessons to meet the childish understanding. He planted in their minds the seed of truth, which after years would spring up and bear fruit into eternity. So, you know, when children ask questions, uh, we need to answer them in their level. And that's not always easy, but when we think about it, to answering simply is really the best way. And so, even when we get older and we're talking to people who are worldly wise, we need to answer in a way kind of like Jesus did in the temple when he was 12. He asked questions. And he said, well, if that's true, how do you explain this or the other? Jesus could look at these children and he would see all their lives flash before his eyes. He could see what they would be in the future. He saw some of them that would become leaders of the Christian church. He saw some of them traveling to other countries bearing the message of truth. He saw some of them that would even become martyrs, that would give hit their lives for Jesus because they had known Jesus, would be persecuted by pagan powers, including pagan Rome. Ooh. And he saw all this as he touched each of those children. Yeah, they had a personal experience with him, a very real one, and when they tried to deny, when they asked him to deny his divinity, they knew that that just couldn't be. That's right. So mothers wish for their children. You're a father. Mm -hmm. You have a, a wife who's a mother. Having appreciated their contact with the Lord, what noble desire did some mothers have for their children? Are we today constantly presenting our children to the altar of the Lord in prayer for him to guide and bless them? The noble desire of these mothers was to have Jesus hold their babies and bless them. And that is our desire too. And I would say yes, we are constantly pre presenting our children before the Lord. In all my prayers I pray for my children. All my private prayers. And I pray for my wife. And this is important as fathers, as husbands, to bring before the Lord our children, even like these women wanted to bring their children before the Lord. And it has an influence upon other mothers and upon other children. I noticed with our youth study, the fact that there was going to be one young person there, two young people, made it acceptable for the teens to be present and to hear and to come and to mm -hmm. learn. Another factor I'm thinking of here that is really pretty important is the relationship between mother and father and family. We don't talk about that usually in this context, but we have these men who are following Jesus, and yet there were women around them, and there were children around them. And so as they related with Jesus, we know, as we see in some of the lessons here, that the disciples rebuked him. We see that in question five. So it's really important here that Jesus is teaching us as leaders in the church how to react not only to the children but to their mothers. Their mothers should have our respect and our time and our consideration. So there were brought unto him little children that he should put his hands on them and pray. 
Yeah. So when we talk about a baby dedication, mm -hmm. um, you know, this is not something that is, doesn't have an example. It's there in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's repeated, and we have the testimony of the spirit of prophecy. It says, among the Jews, it was customary for children to be brought to some rabbi that he might lay his hands upon them in blessing. And if we were to quote from Christ, our Savior, which was a book that Jesus inspired Ellen G. White with, where she told the story of Jesus for, at a child's level. It says there that the rabbi would receive the children and lift them before the altar to the Lord, saying they were God's gift. Mm -hmm. And we need to do the same. We need to lift our children in prayer. We need to live, lift our children in hope, in love, the worst thing a parent can do is reject the affection that their little girl wants to share with them or their little boy. Sometimes we have different responsibilities and pressing issues, but when they come to hug you, when they come to kiss you, don't put them aside. Give them all your attention. Return that affection to them. That is so important. Because every emotion that you recognize and encourage is strengthened. That's and that's right. what you want to do. You want to give them reasons for that. And so we find here also that it was customary for Christ to bless the children. What do we do at the end of a service when we have an ordained person in a congregation? Isn't it basically the same principle when we lift our arms before the people? We're you know, asking God to bless the congregation. How much more it means to a parent to lift the child also before the Lord. Yeah, I want to encourage every preacher to have a corner, a children's corner in your second service, to have a children's story. Because the parents and everyone in the audience pays more attention to that children's story than to anything else. And the mothers appreciate so much the time that you have spent with those kids. And when you spend the time with those little girls and those little boys telling them a story they will remember, they will behave better during the second service, during the sermon. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's very important, it's very nice. I, I've said before, I, I put almost as much thought and energy sometimes in the children's story as I do in the sermon, because it's so important, because those little minds are growing, they're, they're like sponges, they absorb things, and you want to mm -hmm. say every word just right, you want to uplift the Lord before them, because they too are bought by the blood of Christ. So by his, this act, the Bear Brother says, they showed their faith in Jesus, that, as the mothers, and an intense anxiety of their heart for the present and future welfare of the little ones committed to their care. So let mothers come to Jesus for their perplexities. They will find grace sufficient to, to aid in the management of their children. He still invites mothers to lead up their little ones to be blessed by him. And so if your children, mothers, if your children don't want to come down for the children's story, come down with them. That's right. Sit with them. If the, and that tells us something too. If the children don't, doesn't want to come down and sit with the preacher, the preacher needs to do some work mm -hmm. for that child and with that family. He needs to come into that family. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I've, one thing I've learned, and if you will forgive me for saying this quite frankly, you can tell the attitude of the parents toward you by the children. Uh -huh. If the children are really don't want to see you, it's because the parents have probably said something in a negative uh -huh. way. So you need to find out. That's an indication that you need to visit that family. You need to find out if there is anything between you and them and come close to that family. And uh, we find that when we do that, there is a, a very good indication of what um, we perhaps need to learn also. The children will teach us if we'll learn to listen to them. They'll teach us some of the defects that we might have and need to overcome. So need of Christian sensitivity is a good point at this very important juncture in the lesson. Was Jesus pleased with the way the disciples treated the children? We know no, the answer. No, he wasn't. How is it with us today? Are we, through our words and actions, bringing children and youth to Jesus or are we pushing them away? We've already really answered this uh -huh. question, but there's some other things that we yeah. can bring out in this question. How is it with us today? Well, let's say, how is it with the world today? The world today mistreats children. They're abused. They're discriminated. 
When adults are talking, they're told to step out. And if they can't listen, they can't participate. And many of them are beaten, which is awful. They're yelled at. They are not treated as little people, but as animals sometimes. As an inconvenience, as trouble, as a yes, problem. as a problem. Now, we are not to treat our children like that. They are the little brothers and little sisters of Jesus. Are we, through our words and actions, bringing the children and youth to Jesus, or are we pushing them away? We want to bring them to Jesus. We want to spend time with them and talk with them and play with them. And listen, dear parent, if you don't spend that time with your child, someone else will. Very important thought. <clears throat> um, so the disciples thought that they wouldn't be benefited by a visit to Jesus, but Jesus put them uh, kindly in their place and said, no, let the little children come unto me. And he himself had drawn them to his presence. It's interesting, too, when we think about this, that Jesus didn't come into the world as uh, something sending from on high, as a mature person he came as a little child. As a babe, yes. born of the Virgin. That is uh, remarkable that God could have had such patience and foreknowledge that he would save the world through this little creature, the most helpless, helpless, defenseless right. creature. The last subtitle reads, special attention for the children and youth, the special attention. And it says, how willing was Jesus to give his attention to the children, considering them as potential candidates for heaven? And in what manner should we receive the kingdom of God? Okay. Well, according to the implication here, as we receive children, so would we be received into the kingdom of God. Jesus said, suffer the little children, forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. So if we don't receive uh, the children... God is not going to receive us into his kingdom. So what can we say about this lesson in, in a, a very simple way? Uh, the children are not just like uh, a stranger or a foreigner. They're not a neighbor next door. They are flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. And so they are like ourselves. And many times what the, worst, the hardest thing that we find to accept about our children are the traits that they have inherited from us. This is what really upsets us the most, probably. I've seen this many times. But when we think about, you were just talking about yelling at children, and um, this is what I see a lot in, in the world, especially in certain cultures, that we do raise our voice at our children. And uh, it's wonderful to understand, and we learned this from uh, Dobson's books, that the children do not listen to our words they look at our actions. Mm. They do not care what we say. They just know that when we raise our voice, we're going to do something. So it would be better to lower our voice and get up out of our chairs and say it the first time and mean it. So they do not go by what we say. They go by what we do. So if you want to change the obedience of your children, if you're having obedience uh, questions at home, there's a couple of things that are very important. First of all, don't raise your voice. If you say something, mean it. You get up out of your chair, and then you help the child to do it. Secondly, very important also, that you give the child a choice between two things. Both can be relatively good. They don't have to be one bad and one good. So you give them a choice. And it's like, well, uh, it's time to go to bed. In five minutes, we're going to put away our toys. And uh, you can either have a children's story or go to bed, or you can go to bed, and then we'll have the children's story. So give them a choice which way they would like to do it. Uh -huh. So giving children choices, not too many choices. You give a child too many choices, they go ballistic because they can't make those choices. Child, depending on how old they are, two choices is plenty. Maybe three when they get to be four or five years old at that age. But when they're young, you need to give them only two choices, one between the other and the other. So there's one saying, don't give in, give choices. So what we say now here in this, if we really love our children, we will not be angry with them when they do what is natural, which they've inherited from us. 
we will realize it's time for us to get out of our seats or quit doing what we're doing and go help the children do what we've asked them to do. And the third thing is never ask a child to do something that you're not willing to do and willing to help him do. So there we go with some very good advice for the children and for their parents. And as we do that, what will happen? What, would do, what will happen when we deal this way with our children? I think our children will become our friends. They'll trust us. And the way they relate to their parents is the way they will relate to God. You know, one of the tests of a young person is, um, does she like her father? Does she get along with her brothers? Does he get along with his mother? Then you can also expect that he will get along with you as a man. Mm -hmm. So this is important right from the beginning that we teach our children to trust us, that we're listening to them, and that we care about their feelings and their little hurts and their desires. Question number seven, the last question. What was Jesus very pleased to do? And with what tenderness, following the Savior's example, how much time, attention, and love should we devote to the children and youth and the family and in the church, especially in our difficult time? Well, you know, I think we should put a point in here that if we have children in our churches, we should consider what to do for them, and that is not to send them to the worldly schools, yes. but that we should have schools for our children. Even if there are only six children, we should try to find a, have a, way, find a way to have a church school. And uh, we may not be the greatest teachers uh, in the world, our greatest knowledge, but there are textbooks, there is a Bible, and this will be a great blessing for us to help our children, because by helping others, we help ourselves. So how much tension and love should we devote to the children and family? Um, it tells us that he laid his hands on them and departed thence. So it seems to me that when Jesus left a place, it says here that he didn't forget to say goodbye to the children. Hmm. He took them up in his arms and put his hands upon them and blessed them. I can see him putting his hands over little Jacob and over little Rebecca and blessing them and carrying little uh, John in his arms and telling him to be obedient to his parents. The words that Jesus said stu stayed with those children forever. It says he took the children in his arms, he laid his hands upon them and gave them the blessings for which they came and the mothers were comforted and they returned to their homes strengthened and blessed by the words of Christ. They were encouraged to take up their burden with new cheerfulness and to work hopefully for their children. The mothers of today are to receive his words with the same faith. Christ is as verily a personal savior today as he was when he lived a man among men. I can imagine Jesus hugging these children. I can imagine Jesus kissing them on their forehead mm -hmm. and wishing them the blessings of God. And God can speak to us today, too, to yes. those children as Christ was. You know, um, we find here that the words and our actions speak so strongly uh, toward the children. And it's the way we speak to them, the way we handle them. And I would like to say I was a young man and had that terrible automobile accident so many years ago. And a man named Jack, I had met him in church once, and he was the first one at the scene of the accident. And I was terrified by what had happened to me and speaking uh, to, to him about certain things. And he came to me and he touched me and he said, everything's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. And that calmed me down. And because of that, his words probably was a great deal of the reason why I survived that accident. Because he said, I'm sure he knew that it was fatal. Because, you know, I was the only person that ever had survived such an accident for 25 years after that. But he knew that things weren't going to be all right, but it would be better for me to die in peace, I guess. But God gave him those words to speak to me. It's going to that be all right. right. It's going to be all right. It'll be all right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, these children, they are screaming. They're having some problem. We need to speak good and kind words to them, comfortable words. The Bible says God speaks comfortable words to us. And so it's a very powerful thing. 
to have a calming spirit uh, and a peaceful attitude because if we get all excited and, and go off that way, yeah. it's not going to help. And a children. change of scenery, especially with the little ones. You yes. change the scene for them. They're crying about this. You pick them up and show them something else. Hey, look at this, and they'll forget it. Yeah, that's right. That's another perfect lesson that we can learn. And that's what we need to do when we're tempted as well. We need to do that for ourselves and for others. Point them in the direction of faith and the beauty of God mm -hmm. in the world. And then we can see things from another point of view. Amen. So may the Lord help us as we take care of our little people whom Jesus has blessed. And he was a lover of the children and ever accepted their childish sympathies and entered into their games, their childish games, it says in another place. So let's remember that these are precious gifts from God and they are a test also of our Christian um, spirit and conversion. May the Lord help us to realize that Sabbath, tithe, family, and children are all given to us to perfect in us the spirit of heaven, the spirit of unselfish giving and sharing for others. And let's not push any of them away, but to invite them all to Jesus.